Bon, je ne vais peut-être pas trop tarder parce que le, le temps est serré. Alors, c'est une session en anglais, so I'm going to switch in English. Uh, today, I welcome Max Herman, who works at the Mozilla Foundation, who is one of the executives of the Mozilla Foundation. Uh, Max Herman is going to, to talk about the communities and the openness and how it works and how we can use it in companies. And he, wish, he will finish on uh, how communities can be useful to, for social projects too. Okay, so uh, Mark will talk for about 55 minutes. And, oh, wow. Uh, here we go. 55 minutes? I don't think I've ever talked for 55 minutes. Uh, so hopefully I'll talk for about half an hour, 40 minutes, and we can get into a, a dialogue a little bit. And uh, what the, the USI guys asked me to, to talk about was a little bit of the inspiration from Mozilla or the history of Mozilla in terms of using community and, and participation uh, as a way to kind of push our cause forward, and our cause is keeping the web open. So we titled the, the talk, How the Web Was Won. Uh, and, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit of history about exactly some of the things that have happened uh, over the last really 10 years in Mozilla. Uh, so first to say hi, uh, I'm Mark Sermon. So hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, and uh, I'm executive director of the Mozilla Foundation. Uh, we're a, a nonprofit organization that makes a product called Firefox that maybe some people here use. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about Firefox, but I'll also talk about some much bigger uh, ideas around the web and where it's going. And I really, in doing that, want to make three points. The first point is that openness and participation are the core logic of the web. That's what the web is built on. Uh, it's what makes the web wonderful as an engine of creativity, an engine of wealth, uh, and just a place that's fun. It's not what everybody thinks the logic of the web should be. And we've been through struggles over whether that should be the logic of the web in the past. Uh, and we're in the midst of other ones, and, and we'll continue to have more in the future. Um, the good news, at least from our perspective, and, and I'm one of the optimists, uh, surrounded by a lot more realistic engineers, so they're not, often, not always as optimistic as me, uh, but is that that logic of openness and participation is the logic that wins in the digital world. And I think we've seen that set of ideas come back uh, and succeed on, over what looked like insurmountable odds over and over again in the last 20 years of, of the internet. So I want to talk about that and look at some scary things in the future, but also be optimistic about the engines of, of openness and participation we have. So let me start on this first point. Openness and participation are the core logic of the web. Uh, this is a, a black and white version of the, the back of my business card, uh, which unfortunately I've run out of. And you know, I go around telling people uh, what seems like a kind of a, a silly and obvious thing, which is that I love the web, uh, and I love the open web, and I love what is inside the web. Uh, having grown up as somebody who uh, was sort of a, an activist making communication stuff, I, I used to train other activists in the peace movement in the 80s and the environmental movement how to make documentaries. For me, being able to communicate was really at the core of what I was you know, struggling and excited about as a teenager. Also, you know, as a punk rock kid, it was all about anybody being able to communicate. And the, the things that we have now uh, with the web compared to what we had then are just, you know, I, I could never have imagined being able to just make and shape a message, which all of us do uh, every day right now. So it's a wonderful thing. Um, and the, you know, some of the things that make up the web that I love, and probably you as well, uh, are things that very clearly have elements of openness and participation built into them. So how many people in this room use one of those products? Right. And you know, three of those are very clearly uh, open source to the core and free culture and free content to the core. Um, and you know, Flickr I put it up there because it's actually a very interesting example of a very a mass consumer phenomena with a huge amount of free content inside of it, even though itself is a, a closed web service in, in many ways. I think there's, I, I keep losing count, like 30 or 40 million Creative Commons photos on, on Flickr. Um, and then, you know, of course, a part of the web, at least that I love, is, is Firefox, also made up of openness and, and participation. How many people have used Firefox in the room? So, you know, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and for us, it's not just that Firefox is open source. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But that it's designed as an individual empowerment tool. And so the fact that uh, you have add-ons, which you know, I think we take for granted now, at the time that we started uh, putting out Firefox and uh, put add-ons in there and started to build up the add-ons ecosystem, was a radical idea 
that you could shape what your browser could be by adding features and turning on and off features with add-ons. And that's really in the core philosophy of, of Firefox. And of course, uh, you know, the web we love is made up of all these things that we kind of smile about and play with and even you know, get our, our mother and grandmother to use uh, every day. Um, it's also made up of these things. Uh, the under, things that underpin the web, I think even more successfully than the things we see every day, the, brand, the consumer brands we know, are built on, on freedom and openness. And so I don't know how many people in the room are, are software developers or working on the, the technical layer, but I would just say how many people work on a project where one of these is an element of it? So probably the more geeky people in the room. I mean, these are the, the pipes of the internet. This is a lot of what the internet is, is made with, and it's, it's based on, on freedom and openness. And so one of the things we think a lot about and I think a lot about is <laughs> as we go uh, into sort of the, the next age, I mean, we're already halfway into the next age, where all of what we do on our computers is in the web. There is a question of what is that web we love, what is the DNA, and to a certain degree, what are the principles of openness and freedom that we should be looking for? Uh, because we're, I think we're at a spot where, say, the free software definition, which, which is a set of ideas that helped us move forward with open source, uh, or, you know, all of those things around uh, the free software definition as well, um, helped us get to a point where we had a huge software ecosystem that drove innovation, helped people uh, create tools that were cheaper and better. As we go into the next era of the, of the cloud, it's not clear that that is going to serve us well in the same kind of way because it's not about software running on our computers. So the idea of open source is necessary uh, but not sufficient for the openness and participation to continue into the future. So a lot of this is Mitchell Baker, who's one of the founders of Mozilla and, and my board chair. Uh, and a lot of the time we spend talking about things like what are the things that we can actually have as a sort of checklist of uh, openness and, and participation and freedom that we're looking for on the web. And this is a slide she did about a year ago. We've come up with some different words. But in addition to those elements of free technology and, and the, say the four freedoms of, of free software, really what we're looking for in the web is that there is participation, that there's people built in and that there are permeable boundaries. People can get in and change stuff uh, in the bigger system of the web. Uh, and as you participate, it grows better and more interesting. And I think the really big one for Mozilla, the really big one right now, is shared control and decentralization. The big risk we have that even if you build everything, like Facebook, on free software, which they do, the centralization of the web is a huge risk to the future of, of this thing that we've built uh, and takes away, I think, what the, the openness and participation is that, that we benefit from. And I guess, you know, the, the point I always end this section with, and unfortunately that's not a picture of you guys, but you can't tell because the lighting in here is horrible, um, is that all of this goodness that makes up the web is made by you, is made by all of us. That happens to be people at, at OSCON last year. Um, it's because this is something which Jonathan Zittrain calls a generative system. It's something that as we add to it, it gets not only better but different, or actually can get worse and different also. But it's a system that as we add to it, grows and evolves just like a forest, just like a garden. Uh, and I think that's really important to remember that we all have some responsibility in shaping it, often in a way that, in fact, I think predominantly in a way that we didn't with free software. There may be people here who contributed to open source projects, but there are probably almost everybody in the room has contributed to adding some content or some piece of the web that's made it bigger. So what that means is it's actually quite different than anything that has come before in technology in that it's very much like an ecosystem in that what we add or what we take away every day shapes the thing that it is. And a lot of the things we think about, I'll get that to that towards the end, are how all of us have some role in, in stewarding and protecting uh, this openness as we kind of go forward into the future. But before I do that, I'll tell you the longer story. Because it isn't everybody's logic uh, that the web should be based on openness and participation. Um, and it isn't um, necessarily the logic that um, shapes the, a lot of the kind of mainstream consumer brands like Facebook on the web today. And so, I'm going to, oops, sorry, go on a little history lesson. So imagine back to 2003, not that long ago, but now almost eight years, seven years ago. Um, and so some things to remember in 2003, just to bring your mind back, Chirac was still in the middle of his presidency. 
the Human Genome Project was completed. It's kind of now very exciting then, but now kind of just in, in the past. Probably you didn't know it was the International Year of Fresh Water. Uh, there was another World Cup going on. It was the, the Cricket World Cup, and Australia won. Uh, and the war in Iraq, which is still going on, uh, started then. So it's a while ago. Uh, it's also a time where, from our perspective, the web was in danger. And the web was very different than the web we know and love today. And I'll just give you three examples. We could have a, a whole conference on uh, you know, what, was, what was different about the web then. But the first is the browser situation was very different. Uh, <laughs> so you, know, you still see Opera. Uh, and Mozilla in there in the, the browser stats for July 28, 2003. Um, you don't see Chrome, you don't see Safari, but the more important thing you see is that. Uh, and I don't know if you can read it in the back, but if you add it up, Internet Explorer has over 98% market share. And, you know, on its own, monopolies suck. But the, the fact that Microsoft had that monopoly market share wasn't just a problem of whether you do or do, don't think that a monopoly in web browsers was uh, a difficulty, uh, it was that people were no longer writing for web standards. And so we were at a point um, where people saw a lot, of, uh, a lot of screens like this, and I'll just blow it up for you. Online application is only available in Internet Explorer. So who remembers seeing things like that at some point in history, like most people? And who's seen one in the last week? So, you know, a couple of people, you probably work in government um, or big enterprises. Uh, and uh, so there is a lot of IE6 out there, but it, it's changed. This one is quite interesting. This one is, uh, I could still have done it a week ago. It's probably a couple months old. Um, the uh, Korea basically made a, a decision as a country to not use SSL for, uh, for authentication and, and security. Um, for secure connections, uh, instead based it on ActiveX. And so the whole of Korea is has an ActiveX-based protocol for um, secure connections. And what that means, this is basically where you can get a visa from the Korean government. Anything you try to do, whether it's e-commerce or government transaction in Korea, still only works in the Internet Explorer. So in 2003, we were setting the stage for that world. That was where the web was going. And the other place the web was going at the time was fancier looking websites, which we have a, a lot of today. Um, this is uh, something I pulled, uh, I can't if I got it in archive.org or not, but it's a, a circa 2003 uh, ESPN uh, website. And it, it's not particularly fancy. You see a lot of fancier websites uh, today. Um, but what's interesting is if you go and you view source on that, and I know you can't read it very well, the real content is in this one line in that that whole very normal looking page was all a flash page. And that whole website was a flash website, which is something you still see occasionally, but it's not the predominant use of, of flash. And the thing that was happening with flash was basically the transparency of the web that you can go and view source, that you can go and see how somebody constructed a web page, that you can then go and copy that technique and use it yourself was starting to disappear uh, because people thought HTML wasn't going to be good enough to do interesting, good-looking uh, sites. And Ajax and now HTML5 uh, really changed that. But if you think, how many people in the room are, do some web development of some kind, just to get a sense? And how many people have like, learned by clicking on view source some piece of information or so everybody who's a web developer? And so the other thing that was under threat in 2003, and I think that we averted, although there, of course this is still a, a battle that goes on, is the fact that the whole web by design is open source, not in a legal sense, but in the sense that you can see the source code that makes up the web, copy it, study it, adapt it, and use it in your own way, was under threat. Uh, and I think under quite serious threat, it's hard to remember today because <coughs> we've you, we figured out how to use Ajax uh, and now HTML5 to do a lot of things that we wanted to do uh, with Flash at the time. So from our perspective, and you know, I, I think if you remember back to these things, you probably agree, we were at a spot where the web was on the verge of or, or was becoming less transparent, less innovative, less diverse, less open. I think the innovation point sounds like a throwaway word, but, but we actually have kind of, people in Mozilla have taught me to have a richer meaning of it. It is that innovation that came from everybody who put their hand up who said, I viewed source, 
that was under threat. The fact that we do new things by adapting, by using that generative nature of the web every day in our work in making the web uh, and taking it for forward, that was what was under threat. And so the 2003 web, or the, the IE6 web that these guys still live in at the front, uh, when they see pop-up uh, windows saying you can only use Internet Explorer, uh, isn't the web that we love. That wasn't what the web was in 2003, uh, and nor is it the web we have today. And I think that's the good news. The web is very different and healthier today than it was in 2003. Uh, and not completely because of Mozilla, but I, I think Mozilla, which I only joined recently, contributed a bunch. So uh, what I want to talk about in the second half of this story is the, part, the small part that Mozilla has played in those intervening uh, seven years. So 2003, the web is in danger, and also 2003 happens to be the year the Mozilla Foundation is born. Uh, and the project existed for five years before that as a loose project and with some connections into Netscape, of course. But 2003, a group of people formed an organization saying, we need to break up this monopoly of Microsoft and IE6 or, or Internet Explorer uh, because the web is in danger, because standards are at risk, because this open system that we helped build, a lot of these people were former Netscape people, is under threat. And what's interesting, uh, probably I bet you nobody put up their hands and say, have you ever read the legal incorporation papers of Mozilla Foundation? Yes, nobody. So you don't need to. But this is a, a scan of that or a, a picture of that. And this is the, the kind of purpose clause. And it says a bunch of stuff about <laughs> building software that people can use to access the internet and building technologies that others can use to innovate on the internet. But the clause that always jumps out for me is it says, we're doing this to help guard the open nature of the internet. So here was a group of uh, a very small group of people who formed an organization who said, Let's go out and guard the open nature of the internet. That's what's under threat. That was very specifically in their mind. What was in their mind wasn't, let's just build a web browser because it's cool. Uh, and you know, it, it's kind of funny. There's a, a guy who spoke here last year who's the, the president of um, Mozilla Europe. And uh, his name is Tristan, Tristan Uto. And uh, Tristan had worked at Netscape. He was a kind of European uh, marketing rep for, for Netscape. And a lot of, once AOL shut down Netscape, these people were kind of sent out to the employment agency to try to figure out how to find new jobs. So he t tells this story of how um, he's sitting in a circle, and it's kind of like an Alcoholics Anonymous group, where everybody's saying, OK, what am I going to do next? I've lost my job. And you know, they're not all Netscape people. They're from lots of different companies. They've all been laid off. Uh, and people go around and say, you know, this is how I'm feeling, or this is what I'm going to do next. And he says, well, I'm gonna, maybe I'm going to retrain myself, or this. And Tristan says, well, I'm going to form a nonprofit where most of us are going to volunteer, and we're going to take on Microsoft and kick them out of the internet business. And so everybody kind of looked back at him and said, you're nuts. Uh, and that was the spirit that those people had in 2003. And so what those people did was uh, they got together and specifically focused on rebuilding the web as a platform, not just as something sitting inside of, of IE, uh, rebuilding the browser as a way to support the web as a platform uh, and improve the web as a, as a whole and got innovation moving again. And so, you know, a couple of things that are, were obviously critical in that story. Uh, one was open source. And if, if you actually go back to 98, when the Mozilla source code was released, um, it, that was kind of odd to think that this company, Netscape, would take what had been one of the, the premier uh, products that had made the web successful and give it away for free. Um, and so that was quite critical that there were some visionary people who said that's what we've got to do in order to, to protect the web and keep Netscape or keep the idea of a browser uh, that is standards based going. And you know, we don't need to go into all of that side history. That itself faltered on the Netscape side, but this band of people who wanted to guard the open nature of the internet were able to take that code and build something different. And so you know, some of the things they did was they started just rebuilding a separately uh, designed and branded browser, Mozilla 1.0. Um, and how many people used Mozilla back at those ugly stages? I know I did, even though I was not affiliated. So many of you have a long history with this. And you may recall, if you're a part of that history, is at a certain moment, you know, that, that previous one felt a lot like Netscape, but had some new stuff in it. Felt a lot like IE, but had some new stuff in it. And a certain moment comes out from Mozilla, this little Phoenix thing, 
where there's a faster, simpler browser all of a sudden. And that was one of the really important insights in getting to this point that we got to was saying what people want is not a bunch of bloat, not something with email built into it, not something that's slow, not a lot of features, but just the web. And that was quite interesting. I, I mean, I can always tell that story over beer. That was a struggle inside of Mozilla between those people who were just trying to keep the Mozilla suite going and the Firebird and Phoenix group, which eventually that became Firefox, uh, who said, no, what people want is just something simple. That's what's going to get people excited about the web again. Uh, and so the Phoenix uh, and Firebird project eventually becomes uh, Firefox, which comes out uh, in 2004 in 1.0. And at the time, you still had that same spirit that, that Tristan had, uh, but also people like, we don't know if this is going to work. And, um, and what happens is really surprising to the people who do it, which is, and I apologize, you can't really see this very well, I, I should blow it up. Um, you know, you basically have almost no market share of the kind of Mozilla suite products and the betas here to about 2003 when we're formed and into 2004. And actually, this is where the switch to Firefox happens. And then you see it kind of go through the roof. And I think that slide is old, or that picture is old, and I can't even read it, but I think it says 180 million uh, users. And now we're almost at 400 million users and 25% of global market share. So the, you know, the, ro the goal here wasn't to uh, get 25% of market share or 400 million users. The goal was to get enough that we could push the web back in the right direction and push standards back into the mainstream of the marketplace in how people like you uh, were making websites. And that part worked. Um, and what's important to, to talk about is it worked using openness and participation, not just openness and participation in creating the software and it being open source, although that's important, uh, but broadly, people banding together around the browser, around the web. Um, so in terms of the, the open source side of that openness and participation, here's the, the quick inside tour of how things work and how much leverage there is and was needed to get to the spot where, uh, where we are now. So uh, I'll tell you just the, the bit of story about Firefox development, how it's structured. Um, there's a guy who I work with in Toronto. Uh, I'm Canadian, and it turns out a, a bunch of the people behind Firefox uh, and the kind of lead engineers are also Canadian. We have a small office of about 25 people in Toronto. And Mike Connor is one of them. He was the guy who was what's called uh, the module owner for Firefox, so the top guy who approved commits and didn't approve uh, commits for a long time. Uh, doesn't have a university education. Uh, started a little before 2003, or around that time, volunteering. He, was, he had the worst kind of technical job you had. He was in a you know, tech support call center at IBM. And so bored out of his skull. And so what does he do when he has a few spare moments or when he goes home to kind of work overnight is he volunteers on this thing called Phoenix and Firebug. Um, so you know, doesn't have a lot of technical skills, uh, comes from a small town, ends up becoming the module owner of, uh, of Firefox and now is involved in a, a bunch of our identity products which I can talk a little bit about later if there's time. Uh, so nice rags to riches story. We can make a movie about it one day. But the story isn't about Mike Connor and the fact that you know, somebody from such unlikely circumstances can uh, help to build something that influences 400 million people. The story is that Mike's a part of a development team of right now, I think about 120. Maybe we're getting to about 160, probably, uh, engineers. And so, you know, that itself is, becomes interesting. 160 engineers build something that 400 million people use that generates $100 million a year in revenue. It's a pretty small group for, for what we do. But of course, it only works because there's hundreds of people every single day who also are volunteer contributors to that process. And more importantly, there's 10,000 plus volunteer contributors to that process. And the, the thing that normally uh, explains that really quickly is Firefox comes out uh, in 70 plus languages every release, like every security release, uh, you know, as well as every major release. It comes out in the same day on all of those, it, on the same day in all of those languages, and all of that is done by volunteers. And so just to get the, the sense of the kind of energy and professionalism also that comes from uh, the volunteer contributors to, to Mozilla, it, it's impressive. I mean, no commercial company, not Microsoft, comes out in that many languages on the same day and certainly not all done by volunteers. 
And of course, uh, and I think this is now getting closer to a million, there's huge numbers of beta testers, people who basically create a massive base of people we get feedback from. When you think about the, the agile stuff and the kind of test-driven uh, stuff they're talking about downstairs, the fact that we've actually got automated feedback from such a huge group all the time uh, is a tremendous asset, and we couldn't be as successful uh, as we are with that. And of course, many people not only provide kind of automated crash reports and, and so on, but also file, file bugs. Um, and then, of course, now edging on to 400 million users. And so that's how we've been able to have a very small effort and use that effort in a leveraged way uh, to be successful. And all of that is build, built on having encouraged people to participate. It wasn't a matter of dragging those people. It was a matter of opening the doors, creating the scaffolding for those people to participate uh, and get involved. And, and there's one non-technical example, and then I'll go back to the, the technology stuff on this just briefly, um, is it, it isn't just, from the beginning, it hasn't just been developers who participate, although I think primarily in those 10,000 people it is, software developers and localizers and testers, um, but it also has been just the, the people of the web. Does anybody know what this is or remember this, other than that it's a Firefox logo? So. Pardon? No, not quite. Uh, well, yeah, we could call them contributors. Uh, what happened was, around the time of Firefox 1, people who had been using the betas and who are frustrated by Internet Explorer and who are excited about Firefox said, we need to make a big bang. And so a group of uh, Firefox contributor users, sorry, uh, without really any support from Mozilla, I think in the end we probably uh, did some logistics and administration from them, took the initiative to say, when Firefox One launches, we want to put in a New York Times ad. So this was a two-page Sunday New York Times ad with the word, the names of everybody who contributed $10 or more to, uh, to put the ad in the paper. And so that was thousands of people very quickly, in the course of a number of weeks, came together to raise $200,000, which is a kind of crazy thing to do, but it's a nice historical thing to know had happened. Um, and those people made a bet that openness could win, and they wanted to show that they were making a bet that openness could win. And those weren't people who were participating as Mike Connors or software developers. So uh, I moved a slide and screwed something up. Uh, so you know, the, the point of this is that this is the logic of the web getting people involved, shaping things, uh, doing things. Um, it's how the web thinks. And I guess the important point, the point of this part of the talk, um, it's this openness and participation. Oh, this slide is gone. Um, it's this openness and participation that was how we won back the web. It was by getting these huge numbers of people excited about doing something different and contributing that helped us w get back to the web we have now. And of course, we didn't do that on our own. Uh, but we can played a major role. Uh, the, the story that um, often gets told as a joke inside of Mozilla is what's the best version of Firefox, what's, yeah, what's the best version of Firefox you ever released? IE7. And the point is, really what happened was we moved the market back towards the web being built on standards. Uh, we helped get to the point where Chrome and Safari make sense and actually add value to the ecosystem uh, of the web, and that was based on participation. So that's really the, the entry into point number three, which is the lo it's the logic that wins, in my opinion, in our opinion, in the digital world. And it's certainly the logic that we all, uh, if we care about these things, even if we care about them simply from a selfish perspective of our company succeeding, it's a lo logic that I think we need to back. Um, so just looking forward into the future, first negatively or you know, cautiously and then uh, optimistically, is the web is healthy now. Uh, and I think there's more exciting stuff happening on the, the web, from my opinion, uh, than you know, there, there ever has. You know, not just social networks, but I think we've barely, or we haven't even seen the thin edge of the wedge of what HTML5 is going to mean in terms of the web being a rich entertainment and, and application environment. Um, but there still are very clearly threats ahead, threats that are as serious as the threats were with the kind of erosion of HTML as a standard and the dominance of, of IE uh, as the only browser in the market. And so, you know, what are some of those threats? I, I probably have about 10 I could do. I'll just talk about three. Uh, certainly one, 
is that we throttle the net and stop allowing people to run certain applications. And I don't know whether that's an issue here, but, it, but both in Canada and the US, um, it's a very serious issue that network providers are saying, you know, for now, we don't want you using BitTorrent because it's clogging up our pipes, but really where it's going, and you see a little bit few early examples of this in the, in the States, cable providers and others who want to provide their own VoIP, want to provide their own movies, becoming vertically integrated and taking away the neutrality of the network. And that's really serious because the whole basis of everything that most people in this room make their money on is that we've got this open network that we can all innovate on, that we can all express ourselves on. Um, and there's no question that that is a, is a serious threat. The other one to think about that probably you know, gets usually a lot more debate going, I and mean, I think people agree that leaving the pipes open and neutral is uh, a quintessential part of keeping the internet healthy. Uh, the other one, which I, I think is much more debatable or people get into discussion about, is the mobile web. And so what I see and I think what Mozilla sees as a risk is that the mobile web still thinks like a phone. And what that means is either that the phone manufacturer or the carrier or both have to be asked permission about what you can run on the phone. And so you know, Jonathan Zittrain, who, if you haven't read things by Jonathan Zittrain, who's a, a Harvard prof uh, who wrote a book called The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It, um, you know, he he's kind of tells this great story of the, the switch between CompuServe and Prodigy and all of these old online services uh, and the web. And he said, you know, in, in the time of CompuServe and Prodigy and all these people, um, you know, you needed to, to kind of get into a contract with them. We're going to provide, we're going to be the encyclopedia provider to the, you know, prodigy, or we're going to offer this service, or we're going to write this cool little widget or this app. And, and he says, but you know, Tim Berners-Lee didn't need to go ask permission of the internet to create HTTP and to create the web. And Wikipedia didn't need to go ask anybody's permission to build an encyclopedia that became the most dominant encyclopedia on the planet uh, in order to go and do that. Where we're going with phones, and in particular with the app market places as opposed to uh, using just uh, web-based applications uh, that run in a browser on phones, is back to that world of CompuServe and Prodigy, where you have to have contracts and permission in order to run on a, a, a mobile platform. And of course, it's particularly a problem with Apple, um, but I think the whole app marketplace based on something that only runs on one platform inherently becomes about permission as opposed to an open environment for innovation and creativity and the development of, and creation of wealth. Um, so that's a big risk. Um, and then the one that I actually think is the biggest risk uh, is that identity and data in the social web and in the cloud get locked up in silos that are disconnected and controlled only by uh, a few companies, uh, and in particular that monopolies emerge around identity. Um, I keep saying this thing, and I haven't gone and confirmed it, so I, I may get myself in trouble, but I was talking to one of our people who works on identity, and he said that um, Facebook just changed the structure of their, their account system to create a bigger namespace, and so that they now have enough namespace to give a Facebook ID to all the people who will be on the planet in the year 2100. So, you know, the, the idea that they become the passport for everybody on the planet is at the center of their plans. And that's the kind of thing that we're facing right now, is not only that we can't take our data away from a lot of these web services, but these web services uh, control sort of who we are on the web to a point that we become completely reliant on them and there's no way out. Uh, and the interesting thing in, in that one is <coughs> the, the new addiction strategy is to get web developers and people who are developing web apps to use things like Facebook Connect so their business can't exist unless Facebook Connect continues to have my identity and your identity. And that's a, a kind of a, a collusion and, and a, um, a, a strategy of addiction which is, is pretty, pretty dangerous. So the good news is um, those are, are scary things, but there's lots of people who are working at scale with strong, resilient business models based on the open web, uh, based on the principles of openness and participation, who I think can win. And one of the things is, um, one of the things people often do is say, yeah, sure, so like, show me some of those, and isn't it just you, Mozilla, you're a nonprofit. So, 
you know, for people who are skeptical, I don't know that I, I have a room of skeptics, but I might. I just want to go through three examples of things that kind of give me hope and, and look a tiny bit under the hood of like why I think they've got some resiliency and sustainability and, uh, and scale in terms of, uh, you know, in relation to kind of dealing with those threats. So, you know, how does Mozilla work? I talked a little bit about it, and th there's some, sorry, some missing words here that say focus, business, and uh, kind of structure, or who does it. Um, so uh, you can't read the gray, unfortunately. Um, and so, you know, the, the focus of Mozilla is individual web users. And as I said earlier on, you know, our interest is really about empowerment of individual web users. It, it's not uh, about helping enterprises have a browser or anything like that. It really is about empowering individual web users. Uh, and I can talk about some things we're doing in the future that, that show that, including dealing with some of those identity issues. Um, the business model at this point is search. And so for people who don't know, most of our revenue comes from Google or Amazon or Baidu or uh, Yandex. This, when you search in the, the Firefox uh, interface, we get a piece of, of the ad revenue, a very small one. But there happen to be billions and billions of searches. So it, it adds up to enough money to pay those uh, few hundred people. Uh, and it's a dot .org. Um, there should be no S there. Uh, so we're a nonprofit foundation. And most of who uh, actually contributes, as I showed before, is individual contributors. It's not a model where other companies come and participate en masse in producing Firefox. Uh, there was some of that in the early years. But it really is individuals who come of their own recognizance to, to be a part of our community. So you know, that's very different than, say, WordPress, which also massively successful in its own market, massively successful in terms of scale, uh, very sustainable. Its focus is content creators, not just every individual web user. So it's trying to empower a different group of people. Uh, it's got a great model of a web service combined with open source, whereas you know, that, I think, drives the quality of the open source product that they've got so many consumers who rely on them to run the web service every day, but it also keeps them sustainable. Um, and int and it's, a, it's a dot com where it's web developers who contribute primarily, not people who are individual software developers. Uh, and often those web developers are either running their own small company or they're in a company that um, deploys WordPress for people on some small scale. And so you start to get into an ecology where it's in people's business interest, uh, as well as their creative interest to contribute to this thing and keep it alive. And then, of course, Linux, uh, the focus there is being the underlying engine of the internet. Uh, you know, desktop Linux and my old boss, Mark Shuttleworth, aside, I mean, I, I think the main thing that Linux does is, is and the, the components around it, is uh, be the engine, resilient engine of the internet. Um, and certainly the, the business of that that will keep it going is that it's a cheaper, better engine than anything else. And it's, it's one of these, you know, the grand story of open source that the companies that need it, like Google and, and so on, will keep contributing to it. Uh, because it, it makes their business cheaper and better. And of course, there's many organizations and companies uh, that contribute. And, and that's you know, something that I think gives me a lot of hope, because there's a strong self-interest in people like Red Hat, of course, but also people like IBM, people like Intel, and people like Google in giving back into that ecosystem and making sure that it is rich and, and survives. So to me, that's a lot of good news, because you've got some serious people, and not just serious companies, but millions of serious people involved in addressing those threats that I talked about and the other threats ahead uh, in really concrete ways. And that's something that if you look at kind of trying to get a healthy ecology of any side, side or of any type, uh, isn't always the case. So I think we actually have built a lot of resiliency and weight in this openness and participation that make up the web. Um, the other good news is, you know, as I, I said before, you guys are a part of it and can be a part of it. Um, this is my only Mozilla pitch other than to tell you the history. One of our big focuses right now is to find more ways that the people who contribute to the web, who want the web to be open, can get involved in using our resources and working with us in taking the internet in the right direction. And so two things that have emerged in the last couple years, one, one a few years ago and one just this year, are Mozilla Labs and something called Mozilla Drumbeat. And both of those are basically open innovation platforms where we invite people who want to take the web in, in the right direction to work with us. In Labs' case, um, it's much more around the technology. 
So Labs is doing a bunch of things that will compete in uh, distributed identity and will kind of put the power of your social networking identity with lots of other people back in your hands in a standards-based way and hopefully disrupt the centralization that is happening there. So it's the kind of thing that happens in Labs people can get involved in. And Labs also does a lot of big open innovation design challenges where people can push ideas into the process. And then Drumbeat, similar process, but it's around everybody else, the people who I, I call the people formerly known as users, um, can get involved in innovating and taking the web in, a, in, a, in the right direction. And so inside of that are laboratories or projects for filmmakers, for journalists, for artists, for lawyers, where we're getting them engaged in sort of where we take the web. So the one I'm particularly excited about is uh, a lab that we've got that connects filmmakers and web developers and sort of untapping the creative potential of, of HTML5 videos. So luckily, this is almost the last slide. So we want you to be a part of that. And what I'll do is uh, just give you a quick parting thought, which is to say, uh, I think if you're not, I think most of you probably are, it's time to think like the web and promote that to the people you're working with. And you know, if you think about it, some of these things, they were radical ideas in 2003. Um, and here's a quote from, from somebody uh, who I think is interesting, will be interesting to you, which says, you know, what we want to do is use cutting edge technologies to create a new level of transparency, accountability, and participation for citizens, a very open webby concept, and maybe radical to some people, radical a few years ago. Does anybody know who said that? Yeah, exactly. So that was his technology statement. That was the preamble to his election platform. And so these ideas, which I think are essential for the health of the web, are now mainstream. And if you find it difficult to sell them in your organization, you shouldn't, because they're what is making the web go forward from an economic and a creative perspective. Um, and more important than being mainstream, they're awesome. So thanks very much. Sorry I didn't leave time for questions. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Very interesting.